Bullfrog here. I wanted to give you an update with my mini cows. I'm here with Miss Annabelle. To the side of me here is Quasi. I'll see if Quasi will let me get close to him here in a little bit. But um, they're pretty easy going cows. They, they are still cows. They could hurt you if they wanted to. And so you got to be careful with them. Oh, Annabelle here loves to be petted and rubbed on Quasi. Quasi not so much. He uh, he likes to, he'll, he'll get petted sometimes. He likes treats. But uh, right now he doesn't want to be petted. I just tried to tried to get him uh, on camera here. I might, I might in a little bit see if I can get him come up to me on the other side of the fence. Sometimes he'll get closer. I just want you to be able to see his scale when I do that. But let me just talk to you about my cows. They're doing great. I've had them now since October, and this is now April of 2020. I had them October 2021, so um, they're doing well. I have um, kept them for most of the uh, year in um, a quarter acre paddock. I recently just expanded it to half an acre, and I want to expand it again to a full acre later. I keep them behind this electric fence. Of course, the fence is off. I have learned that I can trick them I can turn the fence off for a week at the time and it takes about a week for them to figure out that the fence is off and then they'll start to test it and Annabelle here is tall enough she'll just step on it and go out. Quasi's not tall enough to do that um, but um, no Annabelle smells my pipe likes the tobacco but uh, but yeah they're great they're so much easier to handle than a full-size cow and no, you're not going to get as much meat off of, say, someone like Quasi uh, as you would a full-size cow. But you definitely get a lot more meat off of Quasi than, say, a, um, a, a deer. So the way I say think about it is think about these as your own little domestic deer that you can keep. They're low maintenance. They just eat grass and weeds. They browse on my blueberry bushes, eating a lot of the vines off of them for me, doing a lot of pruning for me. I'll show you some of the pruning that they've done here that I'm pretty proud of. They do a pretty good job of, um, <laughs> she, just, <laughs> she just nipped at me. Uh, they do a pretty good job here of um, pruning. Oh, baby, you can't eat my shorts. Uh, but uh, she's bony, but that's, that's milk cows are bony. You, I mean, you can look at him and see he's thick. They get some uh, supplemental mineral in a block here that she's licking on. They get w fresh water every day. Now, I just use a plastic water tub that I carry around. Maybe Quasi will let me get close to him now, and you can see just how little Quasi is. Look how little he is compared to me. He don't necessarily want me to touch him. I'm going to kind of respect this distance here, but I do want... You see how small he is? See how little? He's, his hump is about waist high on me. He's about... He, <laughs> I mean, he, it, it would be an exaggeration to say he's the size of a dog. He's, he's definitely thicker than a dog and, and taller, but he ain't... He ain't that much tall. Now, see, he on his own terms, he'll take affection from me, but it's got to be him wanting it, not me. Um, sometimes he likes to be scratched behind the horns, and he'll let me do that like he is right now. But he'll get kind of, when he gets kind of shaky, you just sort of pull away. And uh, But a bull like this is just, I mean, he could hurt me if he wanted to, but he's just infinitely so much easier to manage than a bull that can look me in the eye. A bull that would look me in the eye... Um, you can have friendly bulls that you can get in with and mess with, but I'd much rather deal with a, a friendly bull that is <laughs> this tiny. Um, my plan is to get um, to get a mini zebu heifer that's of his kind and his build, so I can make more like him. I don't think I'm going to get another milk cow. She is pregnant. Uh, her bag's starting to fill up. I think she's going to be due in the end of summer, August or September. She had her last heat sometime, I think, in the beginning of November. And she hasn't had a heat cycle since. I think he got her bread then. So um, I want to get at least one more unrelated zebu. And then I might keep the first generation off of these. And then after that, any more that I breed that are kind of getting inbred, I'll just eat those. So... Um, I'm going to climb out. Quasi's all right, but you see he's getting a little agitated. Let me get out of here and let me show you. I want to show you how good they are at pruning the blueberries. They do a really good job doing that. And uh, they, they took three bales of hay during the winter is all it took to feed them on the, when I had them on a quarter acre. And I think if I was to expand this out to a full acre, I don't think I'd have to buy them any hay in the winter. I think they'd find enough green weeds and whatnot to subside off of. So, 
we're gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get out of here, and I'm going to see. He likes that, all right. And uh, we're going to um, see about um, see about showing you some of the the browsing that they do. So here is an example of a blueberry bush that the cows have cleaned out around. This was choked with vines and weeds and whatnot, and the cows cleaned all this up around it here. Um, and uh, blueberry bush, you see, looks very vibrant. Now this bush ain't gonna make many berries this spring because the cows also browse the bush itself and they'll take off about that much growth which is the late summer and fall growth that produces the berries the next spring. You wouldn't want to put the cows on, on your blueberries every year. What I'm gonna do is rotate them so that they clean them up one year, one section, and then that section then produces blueberries the next spring when new growth comes out as it's all this nice new growth coming out off of this bush that the cows have cleaned up and pruned is going to produce a lot of blueberries the next spring. Uh, they've, they've pooped all around here, the cows have, so it's also fertilizing my blueberries. I don't fertilize the blueberries otherwise, and it's just it's great. Let me show you, show you some more of this row right here. So here's a blueberry row that the cows cleaned up this winter. Uh, they were on this area for, I think, two to three weeks at the most. I think, I think two weeks. And uh, they came in here, cleaned up all under the bushes, got a lot of the vines out of the bushes here where they could reach. Now you see, here's, here's some up here they couldn't reach because they're too small. A taller cow could probably reach to the top, but I'd also be scared that a taller cow would do more damage to the bushes. But um, overall, they've cleaned it out really well. Definitely better than I can do mechanically. So um, I'm going to try to rotate these cows throughout the problem patches in my blueberries, the worst patches where the vines and, and undergrowth is, is bad is where I'm going to put them. And as I maybe expand my herd, I got some degree of confidence based on what I've seen they will really do a good job of maintaining the blueberries. Here are my three areas I had hay. I only fed them three bales of hay this winter. A bale here, a bale there, and a bale down there at the end. And I've turned each one of these into a um, kind of a compost patch here from the, the hay that was left. You can see there's cow poop mixed all in this. And uh, this is one of my daughter's um, watermelons here. I'll give you a closer look at it. And um, I got a cage on it right now. Here's a, there's rabbit pellets all in here. The cotton tails would uh, decimate it if I didn't have some protection on it. Now once it gets established and it's about ready for the cage to come off, it will grow faster than the rabbits will mess with it. But it's still a few days away from that. Here in this patch I have a seminal pumpkin. And uh, the seminal pumpkin ought to just really thrive in this. I grow these every year, often from volunteers that come up in my garden, and they will just take over, you know, they'll easily take over a quarter of an acre, one single plant. So I think this one's gonna thrive here. And let me show you something else that's right next. Take a look at this palmetto. If you don't have palmettos where you are, palmetto is a kind of small palm that grows all over Florida. And um, so this is a saw palmetto because it's, it's got little uh, stickers on the sides of the stems here. And this is not what it's supposed to look like. The cows ate the fronds off of it. I didn't think anything in the world would eat a palmetto frond because they're very, very tough. Not, not the sort of thing I'd expect anything to eat. And I wondered, well, does it mean that my cows have a nutritional deficiency? So I did some research. Let me show you what a healthy palmetto looks like and what my research showed. This is a healthy palmetto that the cows have only lightly browsed on because this hasn't been in the paddock with them. You can see where they've eaten. When I let the cows out, when I move the paddock around, I let them roam the farm for a day. And they love to come to wherever they find palmettas and eat the fronds. And I found out that it was actually very normal 
for free range cattle in Florida to to subside off of palmettos. Um, I had cows growing up, but the cows we had were always on improved pasture. They were never really out in deep woods. But go back in time a hundred years ago, and virtually all cows in Florida were kept free range. You may not know that it was Florida, not Texas, that was the primary producer of beef for the United States through the Civil War. Now, after you get past the Civil War into the 1870s, 1880s, it becomes Texas. But prior to that, it was Florida, and cows thrived in Florida free range so long as they were adapted to the environment. And we had a kind of cow called the cracker cow that was a Spanish cow that had adapted to Florida and they thrived wild all over the Florida woods and uh, people just rounded them up in cattle drives and uh, that's where Florida's uh, cattle industry came from. But they apparently thrived on palmettos and, and if you have seen the Florida woods, Florida woods can be nothing but palmetto. So that was, I, I, I didn't realize anything in nature would eat a palmetto frond. Turns out domestic cattle love to eat them. And it makes me think, you know, there were bison in Florida before there were domestic cattle. And it makes me wonder, did the bison come through and keep the woods cleaned out? If I was back in Florida, say, in 500 years ago, would the woods be more open than what I know them now? Not just because there was wildfires that, that happened more often, but because there were bison coming through and keeping them open. And then maybe 150 years ago, were the cracker cows falling into that same niche where they were they were just browsing the woods and keeping the woods open i do remember on the family farm we had about 20 acres of hardwoods on there that were very open when we had the cattle and when we sold the family herd uh those woods got really thick really thick and really viney and weedy so uh, cattle may have more to do with keeping woods open than what i have ever thought we think of cattle being grazers and they are grazers but i think they're also browsers much more than what we realize so there's an update on my survival cows i am very pleased with them both i really like quasimodo um I can tell that he thrives on weeds better than the milk cow does, and I really want to get some more pure zebu in the future, but I will keep you updated as my cows continue to progress. I hope to have a calf to show you late summer, early fall thereabouts. So uh, thank you for watching.